Well, we are in the, we are in the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. If you'd like to open it in your Bible or your iPhone or whatever it is you're using. And we are at a verse number 11 of the 16th chapter of the book of Acts. Um, the Apostle Paul, of course, we know that right now they are on missionary journeys. Uh, and those missionary journeys are to plant churches. That's the purpose, you know, uh, of his journeys was to plant churches. You can't build a ministry on yourself. <laughs> I need to say that again. You cannot build ministry on yourself. You can't. It doesn't last. You know, have you, have you remembered over the past pastors or preachers who preached on TV and you don't ever see them again and nothing happened after they died? Can you think of somebody like that? Thank you, dear. I appreciate it. Um, somebody used to be on TV big time, but they died and that was the end of it. Because, yeah, Rex Humbard was one. And uh, the point is that you can't do that. It, if it's built on you, your name, uh, or anything like that, it's not going to last beyond you. And that's why it's so important that we realize that it's not all about us. I don't care who you are. I don't care how big your name is. It's not all about you because there's only one name Amen. under heaven where men may be saved. And it's the wonderful name of Jesus. So everywhere Paul went, his goal was to establish a church, put people in charge of that church, organize a place of worship, and leave it and uh, keep a check on it to be sure mostly that they were preaching the right doctrine and that they were functioning in righteousness. That was his, his goal until he died. But when he died, thank God, we still have what the Apostle Paul planted, don't we? Aren't you glad? Amen. We still have what Paul did. It's in your lap tonight if you got your Bible or it's in your hand if you got your phone, whatever it is that you got. It, you have that, what the Apostle Paul left us because it wasn't about him. It was about the message that was so crucially important. And so he followed the Holy Spirit every step that he took. He didn't do what was comfortable or what he thought would be the best choice. Remember, he was going to go over to this place, and God said, don't go yet. And then he would go over to another place. He, he was obedient to the voice of God. And uh, so uh, we know that uh, previously Paul had a vision where a man from Macedonia, which is a Gentile area of the world, a man from Macedonia said to him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so the Apostle Paul then knew that he had heard from God and he went over to Macedonia and the biggest, one of the biggest cities at the beginning of Macedonia is Philippi. So he went straight to Philippi to minister and that's where we pick up with uh, the story of the Apostle Paul and this missionary journey. Uh, there's so much in this chapter. I don't know how much we'll get to, but that doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. But uh, in, uh, in chapter um, 16, verse 11, the first two verses say, Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came a straight course to Samothetria, Tresia, and the next day to Neapolis, uh, and then from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia. And we were in that city abiding certain days. You know, he said he was in the city abiding certain days. Now, I don't know if y'all know or not, but... Some people ask on Facebook sometimes, who do you want to see? When you, who's the one person you'd like to talk to more than anybody else? And of course, a lot of people say Jesus, and that goes without saying. But my favorite person to talk to outside of being around Jesus is the Apostle Paul. I'd love to be able to sit and talk with him. I consider him a giant uh, in, in the kingdom. And uh, when he got over to Macedonia, when he got to Philippi, there was no welcoming party. There was no great entourage. There was no previous newspaper, radio, and television announcements saying the prophet and the apostle is showing up at Philippi. None of that. When Paul went to Philippi, nobody knew him. 
Nobody knew him. He went because God told him to go, not because people wanted him to go. He wasn't influenced by what people were saying or doing. He heard the voice of God and he went to Philippi. And the Bible says he dwelt there certain days. I don't know how many days. And I assume he dwelt somehow in maybe some kind of public dwelling or under a tree. I don't know. I don't know where. Nobody paid his bill to get there or paid his bill to stay there. Y'all get the point I'm making. He went into Macedonia. And when he got to Macedonia, guess what? He could have said, where is that man? <laughs> in, the, in the dream, there was a man said, come on over to Macedonia. When he got to Macedonia, he couldn't find that man. If you're looking for self, uh, whatever, acclam acclamation, you're not worthy to be a minister in the kingdom of God. It's not all about anybody. Right. I tell you, it's not all about anybody. And we should never put anybody on a pedestal, and we should never put ourselves on some kind of a pedestal either. Right. I'm going to tell you, I've always been reminded that God can use a donkey. Yep. That's right. And, he, you know, and the devil can use a snake. So, I mean, you know, we can make ourselves available, and if we're not careful... We'll be used by the wrong spirit. And especially if we begin to feel like we're gifted beyond, you know, we're so great. And boy, I mean, this church wouldn't make, we had it years ago when we first came to Natchitoches. Our church was running about 25. And uh, we ended up with just a little smaller number than that. <laughs> and there was a woman got mad at me. Can you imagine that? <laughs> and, and she left. Now, she came back later, and she was my friend. When she passed away, she's no longer here, but she became my friend again. But she got mad at me, and she left the church. And later on, she told me, I thought that church would just fall apart when I left. At least she's honest. <laughs> it didn't. <laughs> it didn't fall apart when she left. What I'm trying to say to you is that we need to get ourselves a proper perspective of ourselves. Amen. The Apostle Paul was not upset or bothered that he did, you know, he had gone into cities before when he got there, man, they were ready to put him on a pedestal and make him a big God. So he went from that to go into a place where nobody even knew who he was or anything about him. And what an amazing thing that is to be able to, to be nobody. To be able to be a nobody when you know what God has done in the past through you. To just go and be a nobody. And not offended if somebody doesn't know who you are. How important that is. You know, there's something wrong in the ministry when a person is too important. No matter who it is. I want you to know something about it. God wants all of us. But the kingdom can make it without any of us, without whoever of us. Because it, we are not indispensable. God is the only one who is indispensable. We are not indispensable. I'm not trying to get rid of any of you <laughs> when I'm saying all this. And it hurts, by the way, sometimes when a person leaves when they're not supposed to. It hurts. Hurtful. But still, we must realize we're not in control of that. People can do what they want to do. And we must keep our eyes where they're supposed to be. And so when Paul got to Macedonia, nobody there. There were no men to meet him, by the way. There was a woman who, even though she didn't know about the gospel, she had experienced and came to know the true God, who the true God was. See, there were worshipers before Jesus was introduced to people. There were worshipers of God who knew nothing about Jesus yet. And so that's when the Apostle Paul would go to the synagogues 
and he would teach them the way concerning Jesus Christ. He would bring the Old Testament uh, across into what Jesus did and help them to understand that Christ had fulfilled an Old Testament and the law and everything. And so he would teach all of that as he went into the cities, different cities, there was always a synagogue there and he'd go to the synagogue and he would teach the way of Christ to the Jewish people who had been taught the word of God in the Old Testament, the knowledge of the Old Testament word. And so he goes to Macedonia and there's no one who knows anything about anything, but he meets Lydia. And Lydia is a woman, the Bible says there was a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira. Now she was not a wearer of purple. She was a seller of purple. In other words, you know, rich people were purple back then. It was an expensive uh, commodity. So she handled all of that, but she was just an ordinary woman that was working and holding down a job. How many of you can say, that's me, I'm just an ordinary person. I'm holding down a job, I'm just doing ordinary. I want you to know that God didn't really have any ordinary people. Because all of his people have great potential. All of his people. Doesn't matter if you're just a storekeeper or if you're a homemaker or if you're whatever in the world you may be, your classification, retired or whatever it is that you are, does not hinder God using you. Lydia was just an ordinary person, a seller of purple. She was of the city of Thyatira, which means she had somehow or another moved and come over for whatever reason. Uh, but she was a businesswoman. And it says she was from the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God. Evidently there was, of course, um, a, a synagogue in Thyatira and she had known and learned through then and been converted over to Judaism, I'm sure, and understood the gospel, that, that part of the gospel. She came over, she worshiped God and the, the Bible says here she heard them. She was exposed to them as they went out to teach and promote the gospel in the city. And it says, whose heart the Lord opened. Whose heart the Lord opened. You know, the Bible says that you can't come to Jesus, can't come to the Father unless Jesus draws you. And when you're exposed to the message, you choose, even now as a child of God, we don't have to open our heart now. We can come and sit through church and do our duty. And when it's all over, not know a single thing that was said. It's very possible to do that. Or we can come and say, Lord, open my heart. Open my heart. Even if I, I said this Sunday, there are times when you will receive something through the Holy Spirit that I may not even say, or the preacher or teacher, whoever's ministering may not even say that, but you will receive revelation from the Word of God just because your heart is open. You know, you can close your heart. Sometimes I tell, you know, I talk to people about how when kids, when you talk to somebody and you're trying to help them and they cross those arms in front of them like Carol just did, she's illustrating. They cross those, they close themselves up. Like they have given you the body language that says, I'm not listening. I know that. <laughs> You're talking, but I'm not listening. And that's, you know, I'm not saying that you do that intentionally, but if we're not careful, we allow that arm crossing to be just because we're concerned or busy about other stuff. We've got other stuff on our mind. We're in a situation where we're not, the point is we're not letting Jesus open our heart. And we miss so many things because of that. Did you know that? When you come, you know, I'm amazed that people don't come to Sunday school. I think all y'all come so I can say that. <laughs> but people that don't come to Sunday school, because we have the opportunity to come to a class and say, Lord, open my heart. And, and great truths are coming out from this pulpit on Sunday morning during Sunday school. Great, wonderful truths that somebody has prayed and sought God and they're used as an instrument of God. And we need to come with that attitude that says, Lord, I'm, before I sit down in this class, open my heart. 
And before we start doing praise and worship on Sunday morning, before you even start singing a note, because you also need your heart open to the worship, Lord, open my heart. Don't let me stand here and go, open my heart. If you don't get anything else tonight, let us get this message. Open my heart. You know, my dad used to say, the driest old branch cracks the loudest. And that was when people would leave the church and say, well, I didn't feel nothing today. He would say, well, the driest old branch cracks the loudest. I don't want to be dry. I don't want to be dry. And there's nobody in the kingdom of God that God can, God will excuse from touching you. Well, I, yeah, who's teaching Sunday school today? Well, it's Brother Mark. Well, I don't like him much. I think I'm going to wait. I used you, Mark, because nobody don't like you. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't want to use Roger and I, and I, I didn't Carol's been sick so I don't bother her <laughs> but that mentality that says you know we've had people call who's preaching today you know they used to not recently it's been years but Used to, you know, they didn't even announce who was holding or who was preaching a revival. They just say we're having a revival this date. They didn't even care who preached it. Didn't matter. All that mattered was that they come and their heart were always open, hungry. That's why they shouted all over the building. That's why we had church until one o'clock in the morning. Because people came just to open, open my heart, make me sensitive to the Holy Spirit, move me into a place I hadn't been before. God, I need more. I'm nothing without you, and I'm nothing unless I hear from you. Amen. So it doesn't matter who it is who's speaking. It could be, you know, we have chapel services on Friday, and it's Harley and Rebecca and, and Baylor and uh, somebody else, Autumn sometimes, and these, these kids that have a call on their heart. Do you think maybe I know more than they do? I do. (laughs) I've been studying the Bible a long time. But you know what? They can say something that that can get into my heart. The Bible says out of the mouth of babes. So, Lord, open my heart. Don't let me sit here and think, oh, I know everything about that. Come on. You don't. <laughs> There's nothing in this Bible that you know everything about. Right. Nothing. I don't know everything about the message of the cross. I don't know everything about faith. I don't know everything about Jesus. <laughs> like Paul said that I preached Sunday morning, that I may know him. That cry of his heart that said, I still don't know him well enough. I've been serving all these years. I've seen great signs and miracles and wonders, but I still don't know him well enough. God help us to understand we will never learn enough. I need my heart open. It's got to get into my heart. My mind will not work it. Just hearing something with my mind will not work it, guys. The Holy Ghost doesn't work through your mind. He works through your heart. And so, God, open my heart. I pray you will never forget that. It just rang so true to me. If I don't get anything else said tonight, this is so crucially important. Open my heart. The Bible says that whose heart the Lord had opened. Isn't that wonderful? Lord, I hope you say that about me. And that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. So what did she do? Her heart was open. She paid attention. That's what that meant. She didn't just listen to Paul preach and think about what her business was going to be doing tomorrow. She singled out that time and focused always and completely upon what that what was being said she let everything else go she focused completely upon what paul was preaching and teaching 
with an open heart and God did great things. And the Bible says, and when she was baptized and her household, and this means that as a, as a leader of a home, may I say, I'll say this, you should be encouraging your children to follow you. First of all, you should be walking straight in the right direction. You should be encouraging. It amazes me. People say, well, I'm not going to make my child pray at the altar. I'm not going to make my... You make them brush their teeth. Good grief. I'd much rather my child know how to pray than to brush their teeth. And I'm going to tell you the truth about it. You know, there were, there were times when I would go to the altar. My dad kind of made it a law. <laughs> When we went to church, every time we went to church, everybody went to the altar before church. When you came in, every, they just went to the altar. Wasn't no music playing. Wasn't no announced prayer meeting. Everybody just went to the altar for a few minutes and knelt at the altar and prayed a while. Have y'all been to churches like that before? And uh, I always felt like I had to. Or my daddy would probably be aggravated. Whatever it takes, what I say. You know what I did? I went down there. I might have felt like I was doing it for my daddy, but you know what? The Holy Spirit was down there. And he touched me. And when my daddy thought maybe I wasn't close enough to God, and there's a lot of times, you know, kids don't stay close to God. In case you don't know that, let me give you a ding, ding, ding up here. Kids are like this. Yeah, that's where they are. They're not established yet. It's your job to establish them. <laughs> and, and so when I, he would think that I was drifting some, my dad would come and he'd kneel either before church or after church or sometime during the service when I was in the altar, I knelt over like that. My dad would come and put his arm around me and he'd kneel beside me and bawl and cry. Tears would hit the back of my neck. And I've heard him say, Lord, I gave Frances to you when she was just a baby. And she belongs to Jesus, and she, the devil's not going to have her. And I, he just prayed and sought God for me, bending over that altar. And I treasure those times. It's so very important. So you got those kids just for a short period of time. You better do all you can to get them into the kingdom of God and establish them in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So her household came and followed her. This doesn't mean her household has to get saved or has to follow her. But she influenced them and they followed her. And they will, by the way. If you influence your children, they will follow you. If you're strong and if you make a commitment to truly serve God with all your heart, put him first. You're not ashamed to be in the altars. Your children will follow you. And it says, and she besought us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide, abide there. And she constrained us. That means Paul probably didn't really want to go. You know why Paul probably didn't really want to go? He didn't want anybody to feel like that he was paying them or giving them anything extra or paying more attention to somebody or receiving a gift from somebody because the gospel is free. But the Bible says that she constrained them and they went. Now, the Bible teaches us that Lydia had, they had a group that met to pray. They met down by the river to pray. Now, you know, I don't know if they just met under a tree or if they had some kind of a little dwelling down there. I don't know, but they didn't have a synagogue. And let me just say this to you. We need to be so determined to gather together with believers in the body of Christ, it just doesn't matter whether everything is exactly right or not. Amen. You know, there have been times I remember uh, when the power was out and uh, we came over here to church. There was a handful. But you've probably figured out that if things like that are going on, this pastor will have a meeting. We may have to open all the doors and we may have to do some of that Pentecostal fanning. But, but, but we have some kind of a church service because we want to make that available to people. We're not beyond meeting on the front porch. 
because we want to make it available to those people who understand the necessity of gathering together. That I don't know, you know, who knows what the future holds. I'm, I'm praying for a great revival in, in America. I want to see a great move of God in America with all my heart. But if it ever came to the point where we had to meet down by the river or under a tree, would you go? When we didn't have the sound system, when we didn't have people that that could play instruments beautifully and all that kind of stuff, and we just got together and sang a cappella and worshiped, would would you be one of those to say, I'm going to go. I don't care if there's not a comfortable place to sit. I don't care. I'm going to go and meet together with believers in the kingdom of God. You know, uh, Paul was an encouragement to Lydia at this point. Of course, Lydia accepted Christ at this point and her household, and they were baptized. But as I was meditating on this, I was thinking about the fact that we should be more concerned about encouraging other people than in promoting ourselves. You know, the Bible teaches us to take the second place. To, to really honor anyone for, for their gifts. It doesn't mean we have to follow them around. It doesn't mean you have, to, you have to give them any money even. It doesn't mean you have to be with them every single minute. I'm not talking about being glued to somebody and trying to be their encourager. I'm not talking about even mentoring or any of that kind of stuff. It doesn't take much to let somebody know you appreciate what they do. And we don't do that enough. And, and, you know, God uses different people in different ways. And we don't even understand the way God uses people. Y'all don't know it, but we got a couple of guys in here tonight that are lifesavers to, to Pastor and myself. And that's Gary and Perry. I mean, we don't struggle. If they're around, the building is going to be locked up properly. We don't have to do that anymore. And we don't go home and think, we don't go home and think, man, I wonder if Perry remembered to get that door. And there's others of you that we don't worry about something getting done because you take the bull by the horns and you do things that takes a load off of us. And, and that's a great thing. You know, we're not any younger <laughs> Not getting any younger, as they say. I took Rebecca with me to Sam's today. I said, I'm tired of hauling those boxes. She's going to haul boxes for me today because she's got a young back. <laughs> but whatever it takes, you know, it doesn't matter. And we need, to, we need to encourage people. Think about it. Think about somebody who, who is just, you know, there's something to be said about just being consistently here. Every time you, you know, one of you Sunday school teachers gets up to teach, that person never fails to be in your class. Have you said, boy, you mean a lot to me. Thank you for always being in Sunday school. You know, understand what I'm saying? That we encourage people. I, you know, sometimes uh, I love the way you sing. You're a blessing to me when you sing. Or... Thank you for being faithful to the guitar or the piano. Thank you, you know. That's one of the things that I had to, had to really have God do a work in me because I was just not one who saw things. How many of you don't see things? <laughs> I, don't, I don't see things. God has to kind of poke me in the ribs. <laughs> Remember that. But thank God he does and I feel it now. But it's so important to let people know. I'm just, I just want you to know Instead of always wanting to be praised, look for insignificant people that maybe nobody else really gives attention to that and say to them, I appreciate what you're doing. What a blessing. You know, every time Perry comes up here and mows the yard, I come across, if I, if I don't forget it, if I'm too, too crazy busy, I'll tell him, man, the yard looks nice. Hmm. Did that cost me anything? Does it mean something to the church to have a nice cut yard? Yes, it does. So whatever it is, you know, Ellen sees to it that the church house is nice. 
That's something she just does. She wants to do it as long as she can. <laughs> and, and she doesn't get paid to do it, but she gives it. And to say, thank you, Ellen, but because the bathrooms are clean, smell good today, and there's toilet paper in there. You know, those are, those are those, you know, somebody might think, you know, oh, some big minister, Benny Hinn, he's great. How about Ellen McFarland that's cleaning bathrooms? Amen. That makes church better. Come on. To give honor to whom honors do, I believe when we get to heaven one of these days, there'll be people that are honored that we don't even know their names and people we thought would be greatly honored and God doesn't even recognize them. Because God knows everything. And it's such a crucial thing. And so Lydia was encouraged that, you know, um, promotion should come from the Lord, not because we're promoting ourselves. Promotion should come from the Lord. I was thinking about this today. In fact, I was talking to um, Rebecca about it as we were traveling about how that I grew up without any encouragement to be a preacher. Back when I became, when I was a teenager, it wasn't all that common that women were preachers. There were few, but few and far between. And my family, my dad or my mom, nobody encouraged me at all to know there was any gift in me at all about that. I could sing, they knew that, and they encouraged me to sing, but that's all. It wasn't until David Allen saw the gift in me. He saw the gift in me. And one day he said to me, why don't you go get your credentials and get your ordination? I thought, what? <laughs> he said, well, you, you're a preacher. And you need to go and get something that just to, just to validate that, let people know that you have this piece of paper. And so I followed through and eventually became ordained. And all of, all of that would have never happened if somebody, I would have never became a preacher. I would have been a Sunday school teacher maybe, but I would never have preached in this church if years ago, back in 1980-something, early 80s, he hadn't have said to me, you need to, you need to consider yourself a preacher. And you know what, today, he's still my promoter. I told Rebecca today, I said, if my husband, if you went up to my husband and said to him, I'd rather hear Sister Frances preach than you, I hope none of y'all are that stupid, but. <laughs> It has happened. I told one guy off pretty heavy about that. But um, do you know what? It wouldn't bother him. Because we're not in competition. He's not in competition with me. And it doesn't offend him that somebody enjoys me preaching. And so he promotes me. Y'all know he's my cheerleader. Y'all all know that. But what I want you to know is that, what I want you to understand, without his understanding that, encouraging me, I would have never gone down that road. Never gone down that road. So be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You may be a key in some young person's life to help them to understand that God can do something beyond the extraordinary for them. Can take them places they never dreamed they could go and use them greatly in the kingdom of God. Amen? So let's encourage other people. Now we know that uh, God, the devil always has a trap. Yes, he does. <laughs> Anybody ever seen the devil have a trap? Oh, yes, oh boy. He can sure set you up for a trap, can't he? Yes. You know what happened to Paul and Silas after, after this great victory and Lydia and her family are converted and God does a great work right there in Philippi. Then just a little while later, this young woman I want you to remember this now. We'll talk about it more next week, probably. But this young woman started following Paul and Silas around. And she wasn't saying, oh, these are bad men that are here to bring in an insurrection. <laughs> he didn't, she didn't say that. Because the traps of the devil never look like that. The devil doesn't put out traps that go, 
that, that are obviously the devil. <laughs> he puts traps there for you to pull you away from what God wants you to be that sound good and look good. Because that young lady, the Bible says it came to pass as we went to prayer that a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul in us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Following them around everywhere they went, pronouncing this, and I told you they didn't have any great uh, you know, announcements that they were in town. They didn't have any prior notices of people getting out and encouraging people to come to the meetings or anything. But the devil sent somebody to do it. Not that they should have had anything in the beginning, but the devil will all, you know, you know, the devil can do evil and ungodly things, but the, he can trick us into thinking that it's from God. And so she followed them around crying this out. Was this the truth? Was it the truth? Yes. Well, I don't care if it's the truth, if it comes from a demonic source. The source is important. So just receiving something from somebody doesn't mean that it's right. If, if there's a little feeling in your spirit, even though they're saying something that's truth, but there's a little uncomfortable feeling in your spirit, you need to be sensitive to that and say, wait a minute, I don't care if they are saying something that's true. Maybe I don't need to be involved in that. So truth is not the test necessarily, completely, for us getting swallowed into things. Because there's a lot of people that have a, a lot of truth. The problem is if you hang around them and listen long enough, you're going to start seeing little dabs of error. But you can get swallowed into some truth and somebody saying and doing something that your eyes become blinded that when the little bit of error comes up, you're already set up. And you're in a situation where it's not good. But the Apostle Paul, the Bible says he, she went around and did this for many days and the Apostle Paul didn't do anything about it. But when he became grieved. Have you ever been grieved in your spirit? Man, I'm telling you. I've been listening before to somebody talking and man, just that real strong grieving in my spirit because the thing that makes me so grieved is that people are being exposed to that and they're believing it and they're walking into error. And it breaks my heart and I become grieved that the that the name of Jesus is not being presented correctly and that the truth of the gospel is not being presented correctly and it hurts my heart. And even though she was shouting out something was true, Paul by the Holy Spirit became grieved and he turned and said to the Spirit, to the Spirit, that's who he's talking to, not the girl. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her and he, that evil spirit, came out the same hour. But you know what? Just because you see God do some mighty thing don't mean the whole world's going to think you're the greatest thing. Because immediately the people got mad at Paul. And you're going to see they got really mad at him before this is over. <laughs> if you're doing everything for accolades, for praise, you're not going to be working for God. Will some praise come? Of course. People that are blessed when you minister or when you touch lives, some praise will come and thank God for it, but don't ever believe that that's why you're doing it. Don't ever be mistaken in thinking, oh man, you know, 
if the devil can't push you back and, and get you to feel like you ain't nothing, he'll try to push you over to make you think that God, you're a gift to God and a gift to the kingdom because you're so wonderful. That will happen. That's what the devil's job is. First of all, he tries to discourage you and make you not even try. And the next thing he does, if you go ahead and push through and God blesses you and you see the blessings of God, then he'll try to tell you that you are as great as you think you are. <laughs> because that's what he does. So we need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and allow him to do the work that needs to be done. And then don't get upset by people's reaction. Don't get upset by people's reaction. Because you're going to have people that will always not understand. You know, people just don't understand when you're following God quite often. And there will be people that get upset with you. Doesn't matter how strong you're preaching the truth. And you've got to decide if you're standing on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you are walking in the footsteps that God has laid out for you, then, the, then you just keep on. Because, you know, Paul and Silas got thrown in prison, but before they got thrown in prison, they got beaten almost to death. So they didn't change. I just want you to know. Just because people brag on you, don't get moved by that. Don't get moved by that. Take it, as we used to say, with a grain of salt. And always, you know, anytime somebody says to me, that was a great word, I appreciate it. I said, to God be all the glory, because I'm going to tell you the truth about this old girl right here. If I don't pray and ask God to help me when I stand in this pulpit, it ain't worth two cents. I can fall flat on my face and, not, and make a fool out of myself and say nothing worth hearing. It all depends on his grace. And so he gets all the glory. All the glory. Just all there is to it. Okay, it's time for me to shut up. We'll start there at um, verse number 19. Verse number 19 next Wednesday night. The Lord be in our helper. And thank you for your attention tonight. God bless you.